everybody. It has been a long time since I've just sat down and shot a video. I was going to say face to face, but just shot a chatty all in one non vlog, non scripted type of video. And I thought it would be really fun to do a book haul today. Lord y'all, I think the last time I did a book haul was summer 2021. So the books I'm going to share with you today, um, it's not one big massive haul that was made in one purchase. These books I collected, I'm not really sure, maybe in the last six months, but maybe some of them really do go back to that last book haul because you know that's a fulcrum point. I think a lot of us who make and watch booktube content, um, it's, a, it's a tension point on which we try to balance, right? Not encouraging conspicuous consumption or overconsumption, and then also loving books and wanting to support independent bookstores and presses and authors. If you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Emily Page Wilson. I'm a poet and I also write novels in verse for young adult readers. Please feel free to like and subscribe and stick around, especially because I can't make a big announcement now, but I do have some really exciting news coming up that I can share with y'all shortly. So the more friends, the merrier. But now let's just jump into it. I had been meaning to um, list these books in chronological order of purchase, but since we're spanning such a long time period, it's very uncapricorn of me, but I really don't know when I bought these things relative, when I bought these books relative to one another. The first book on top of this stack is Kathy Park Hong's Engine Empire. I believe this book came out in 2012, which is surreal to think that that was a decade ago at this point. But I remember that Kathy came to speak, if I, or do I actually remember? I'm pretty sure that Kathy came to speak to Oberlin College when I was an undergrad to promote this book because she was friends with um, Cosmo Ali, the poet, who was a professor at Oberlin at the time. And I just remember thinking she was so cool. Um, one, just from her own presence and her work, but also I just, you know, Cosmo Ali is very cool. And so anyone associated to him just was like top tier to me. But for some reason, I never got around to picking up that collection, even though it holds a definitive place in my memory. So I have not started reading this book yet, but I am looking forward to it, especially because there's a blurb from Thea Harvey, whose work I really enjoy. Jory Graham also wrote a blurb, and I'll just read you a little bit of her blurb. And I'll just read you, it's not the blurb, it's the description on the back to so that you can get a feel of if this would be something you might enjoy reading. This stunningly inventive trilogy of poems evokes an array of genres from Western ballads to sonnets, about industrialized China to fragmented lyrics set in a virtualized future. And I also picked up this book at Judson Books in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, just a shout out to the independent bookstore there. It was very cute, very cute. I think Eli and I drove to Greenville, South Carolina to go to Costco. Like the yuppies we are slowly becoming. <laughs> Something changed in our 30s. And now we have like three different flavors of seltzer in our refrigerator at all time. Speaking of something cooler than us, the next book in my stack of books is actually a literary journal. This is the latest issue of the Indiana Review, summer 2022. It has been a long time, y'all, since I have just sat down and read a literary journal cover to cover. And it's something that I would like to do again. This actually might be really good reading for my Thanksgiving vacation. I've actually been thinking ahead for two and a half, half months out, but I'm like, what book am I gonna read at Thanksgiving? Because for Thanksgiving, we take a week and we spend it with my husband's family in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. It's a tradition they've been doing for 30 years. I think this year will be my eighth, but this is actually probably better, a literary journal for that, because it's like the Kevin McAllister house in Home Alone. <laughs> There's gonna be like 25 of us and it's fun and it's energetic and not a lot of like quiet reading time, even though that seems like it would be the perfect time to read. So something like a journal that's going to expose me to a lot of new voices and is going to have work featured in smaller bites, right? So individual poems, essays, short stories. This actually might be a really good Outer Banks read. There's also a piece in here by Patricia Patterson, who was one of my former students at UNC Wilmington, which is really weird to say like a former student because I was teaching graduate schools 
I was a graduate teaching assistant when I was 22 and 23 and it's like I didn't know anything <laughs> um but it's really cool I need to give Patricia a shout out on Twitter um but that's really cool I'm really excited to see her work and the work of everyone else in this issue okay guys the next book is one that I was so excited about I put on pre-order this is Matt Bell's Refuse to be Done and it's a craft book look at that I have it's not coffee my friends it's dirt I have dirt on this book it was in my purse when I was filming we were filming a fundraising promotional video I work at a university I'm in higher education fundraising and we're shooting a video for Founders Day and there was a lot of language and imagery about like planting a tree you know planting a seed like the founders did anyway so we were literally planting trees for this photo shoot and this uh, my book was in my bag and somehow it got dirty. That seems like it wasn't a relevant tangent, but uh, Matt Bell wrote Appleseed, right? So it's all connected. The subtitle to this craft book is How to Write and Rewrite a Novel in Three Drafts. I have already read this book. This is the first of the book. I've read quite a few in this stack. So it's a little bit of a book haul, a little bit of a review. It's typically what I tend to do in these videos. And before I share my thoughts on this book, I want to take a moment to say that the older I get, I realize that our opinions about things do actually kind of say more about us than the thing itself. I didn't know if I used to believe that, but the older I'm getting, the more I am just experiencing that to be true, especially now that I take anti-anxiety medicine. I don't internalize things as much, which used to be, I mean, it still is a little bit of a personality problem, toxic trait, but I really am learning that any type of advice or feedback or opinions that people have, regardless of whether there's you know relevant truth that you can use yourself if you're on the receiving end of it, it really is a kaleidoscopic product of that person's experiences and opinions, preferences, everything in their life that has led up to the point that they are giving feedback or opinion. So I want to put that caveat in here before I talk about this book because I love Matt Bell's writing. I think I mentioned it in my last writing vlog. I love his writing. I was so jazzed about this book. I pre-ordered it, read through it, and I don't know if it was the reading experience that I was anticipating, and that says more about me as a reader and what I was looking for in terms of craft advice as a writer than it does about Matt Bell and what it does about this book. So this book is written in three parts and it says that it's gonna teach you how to write and rewrite a book in three drafts. The first section is the first draft, second, the second, etc. And I think I was particularly interested in reading that second draft chapter because I'm finished with my young adult Hurricane Florence project and I have already written a first draft of what I am referring to as my Bigfoot project. I have not touched that project since last summer. I promised myself I'm going to finish my full length poetry collection project on Marie Lafarge. If you are interested, I'll leave some of those poems down below. If you want to read poems about a woman who was accused in 19th century France of poisoning her husband with arsenic in his fruitcake, that's the vibe. So I was really excited because eventually I will have to go back to my Bigfoot project and do a second draft. And the draft, this draft is not as clean. The first draft is not as clean in my Bigfoot project as it was in my Hurricane Florence project. And I know I need a lot of work. I need to do a lot of work. So this book is slim. It's about 150 pages and it was about 65 pages. I'm spitballing here. Um, even though I guess I could technically look it up, but if I'm remembering correctly, it's like 60 pages, 65 pages are focused on section one, 65 or 60, you know, pages are focused on chapter three, section three. And then the section two, which I was the most excited about was like 10 pages, 15 pages. And essentially, you know, the advice is that you really have to rewrite the book. This is you rewriting your book. Like if you are typing it out, start with a new document and literally type sentence by sentence. Do not copy and paste and edit, which I do think is really good advice. And I do intend to do with my second draft. The idea being it's going to be so much more painful to transfer language that you aren't 100% proud of or that isn't working if you have to retype it instead of copying and pasting. But as here, here's where we come back, right, to what we were projecting as a writer, being in a second draft phase of a project, that's what I was hoping to get some insight into. And this book, what I think the book's strengths are is that there are many, many generative prompts 
the sections are written more so as one or a one page to two page like meditations almost about section one is really generating writing prompts so i think if you are somebody who doesn't rely on plot plotting your books before you begin the writing process i can imagine these exercises being incredibly helpful if you are stuck with a scene that's not working or you know maybe you start to feel writer's block and you just need something creative and a little bit outside of your head to push the narrative forward there are really smart editorial exercises for when you get to that third draft and you're really focused on the language the you're at the level of the line you're thinking about cleaning things up and making it as polished and stylized as possible so there's a lot to be taken from this book and i i definitely would recommend this if you have seen it around, if you're curious about it, if you teach creative writing in any way. I think what this book also taught me, again, right, something outside of myself that I am talking about, but that actually tells me more about me than the book itself, is that I like craft books that are either kind of just abstract and inspirational at, you know, the level of letters to a young poet or very structural, let's get down to the nitty gritty, like, um, oh, it might be in my office. Why is that book that I love? The style, it's like style of syntax, the art of the sentence or something like that, or Save the Cat, right? Save the Cat writes a novel. This book, and I could be wrong, this came across to me as being a tool that could be especially helpful for writers who would be more would categorize themselves more as pantsers. And I am just a plotter, you guys. And not that I think that there's actually like this, that the creative process exists in this binary. I don't believe that. And I also am not so arrogant or ignorant to think that just because I prefer a method, that that has to be a method that everyone else likes. But I do kind of want to push back gently, and, and this is out of context of um, refuse to be done, but I do want to push back gently on this idea that plotting takes away a creative layer of the writing process maybe for some people it does but this idea that you know if we're working our way up we have a fun and game section we're working our way up to a false defeat or a false victory and then you know we get to the dark night of the soul if these beats become a part of every single novel are we then creating generic boring narratives and I just think about that in terms of other forms of art that also involve a craft. And for some reason, I do think about it as an architect. An architect. There is a quote in here where Belle is quoting from another author. And if I was a better YouTuber, I would have marked it. But somebody says something to the effect of like, well, if I was an architect, I'm not an architect, I'm an author or something like that. But let me tell you, architects use blueprints i want my arch. eli and i are in the process of trying to you know buy our first home i want my architect <laughs> to use a blueprint and i don't ever walk into a space and say oh god another bathroom oh my god another kitchen another living room all the houses have that yes they do because that's what a house needs to function and i don't think that obviously especially like a westernized form of narrative I don't think that there's only one way to tell a story, but I just kind of gently want to push back on this idea that a well-structured, a well-plotted novel takes away some of that creativity. Because in fact, I find it really generative, right? Me trying to get from a false victory to the dark night of the soul, a lot has to change. I don't know what that's gonna look like necessarily. There's still room to explore in that creative tissue that you have to build to connect thing A to thing B. I don't know what, you know, voice my characters are going to have or what snarky thing that they're gonna say that reveals something about their personality. I don't know how a character is going to react to a false victory or false defeat. I'm still learning and exploring as well in the same way that with the example i use with building a house the devil is in the details right like i don't think oh god another kitchen i'm looking at okay you know how old <laughs> or updated are the appliances is there a really pretty backsplash is there enough cabinetry for what we need is there enough counter space for what we need do the cabinetry and the counter space match although let's be honest we're not really being that picky in this market because it's insane out there. But I just wanted to kind of push back gently on this idea that 
I feel like when I, I first started watching author tube, like plotting was the way to go and people were like, oh, the answers. And now again, acting as if the creative process is a binary, we're like shifting now to like, plotters are boring. Obviously I'm making generalizations here, but those were some of the things I was thinking about after I finished Refuse to be Done. So if you are really excited about generative prompts for you know exploring that first part of your book, if that's the stage you're in, in your writing process with your latest project, or really sharp editorial exercises that are gonna help you clean up the language in your third draft, if this even seems like it fits, if this process even seems like it fits with yours. And if you wanna be thinking about questions like that, right? Like the relationship between creativity and a pantser or a plotter or a planter. Not that these are words that Matt Bell talks about in this book explicitly, I don't think, but these are questions that arrived for me in the reading process. So if that intrigues you, I would definitely check it out. Maybe keep your copy a little bit cleaner than I kept mine. And let me know down below. One, let me know if you picked up this book or any of these books and what you thought. But let me know down below if you would like me to do a writing blog with some of these exercises because that could be really fun and helpful. All right, now that I talked about that for 15 minutes, the next book in my stack in my haul is Only Flying by Brooke Bogat. And I did not order this myself. My press sent this, Unsolicited Press, um, and I think they must have just sent it as a gift. It came with my box of Yalubi, my full-length debut collection. I had not heard of Brooke before, and so it was really fun to be able to spend time with a pressmate's book. This was a really refreshing. Uh, re this reading experience was a refreshing surprise because I just went into something completely clean of any assumptions or expectations. There are a lot of surprising, surreal, what's the word I'm looking for? Associative leaps made in this book. I'll read you a little bit from the back. Uh, thematic threads like rebellion, enlightenment, risk, courage, love, loss, and triumph dance to life with pictures that swing from dark to light, surreal to whimsical, and strange to familiar. There are intimate goddesses here, black widows, buddhas, alley cats, a kangaroo, and magic pants. The magic pant poem definitely like stayed with me. These were poems that I experienced or I thought about after the reading experience. And I think if you are a fan of Sabrina or a Mark, it's not quite the same, but there are prose poems in here, like in Sabrina's To Sim To Sum, just very surreal. And I enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed the unexpected treat of reading a surprise collection. This is a book that I have not yet read, but I picked it up at, um, I did a reading at Malaprops, which was really exciting. And I picked up this book. It is an autographed copy of Give Me Room to Move My Feet by Mildred Barria. And now Mildred is a professor at UNC Asheville, the university where I work. And she helps put on the reading series, the poetry reading series at Malaprops, which I think is posted on YouTube. So I'll leave that linked below if you're interested. Mildred was just very sweet. And I hope that we get to continue to connect personally and professionally throughout the upcoming year. And also her first book, I found this out in like the jacket cover, her first book won the National Poetry Award in Uganda. Like, I'm sorry, if I won a National Poetry Award, I would be like, that everybody would know. <laughs> I would like, I'd be like. Oh, hi, my name is Emily. I'm a National Poetry Award winner. I mean, probably I wouldn't, but like, I wouldn't blame anybody, especially Mildred for like, I don't know, just introducing yourself and being like, I'm a big deal. So I have not yet had time to read this copy, but I am looking forward to it. And like I said, I picked it up from Malaprops. I also picked up from Malaprops, Horse Not a Zebra by Eric Nelson. Eric was one of the readers with me in that Malaprops series. So I picked up his book as well. I had never heard the phrase Horse Not a Zebra before. And you know, Eric read from this collection, which is also named after the titular poem in the collection. And then I heard the phrase on the radio. I think it was NPR, like the next day. Isn't there, there's a, some type of phrase, I think, for that when that happens, when something, you become cognizant of hearing or seeing something for the first time, and then you start to see it everywhere, even though you probably had already seen it, you just weren't aware of it. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Let me know down below if you know what I'm talking about. Eric's poems, when he was reading them, were very easy 
to follow along with while he was reading them. And sometimes that's not always the case. You can have work that's like really, really beautiful. But for me, I'll, I'll be I'll be descriptive here of my own experience. Sometimes I do have to look at work on the page to fully appreciate it. And what I enjoyed about the reading experience or the listening experience when Eric was reading was that these poems that I could follow along auditorily. There seemed to be a lot of like salt of life types of themes very narrative language, very narrative structures to the poems, very straightforward language. So I enjoyed listening to them so much that I decided to pick up a copy. And Eric also um, attends the monthly poetry, I think it's poetry and prose. There's a reading series that another professor, Rachel Hansen, hosts in Asheville that Eli and I go to every month. We just make it a date night. And Eric was there the last time. So that's kind of neat. It's kind of neat to like I think I might do a video. Let me know down below if you would like a video on trying to build or become a part of a poetry community or writing community after you move. Eli and I are coming up on a one year anniversary of being in Asheville, but we also got married this year and we had a micro wedding. So the first half of the year was just that. And now we're trying to get more connected to people in the community. So let me know if you'd be interested in a video about literary communities. Speaking of literary communities, this is Disappearing Ink by Brandon Amico. Brandon is also a poet in Asheville. His wife, Catherine Campbell, is a prose writer. I really, she, she, they have both read together. They both read um, at this reading series, which is called Punch Bucket Lit. It's in West Asheville. And so they often are at the readings as well. I love this cover. This came out Gold Wake Press. When did this book come out? 2019. So it's been out for a little while, but I mean, God, this is stunning. I just, I love, I don't know how true to color um, the footage is going to be, but I just love this teal with this like really deep, what's the, what's the color between red and pink? It's a beautiful, beautiful cover. I love the collage element of it as well. There's a very distinct voice. Brandon has a very distinct poetic voice. And especially if you are someone who, you know, millennial probably, but even not just millennial, if you think a lot, if you have a lot of anxieties, financial anxieties, environmental anxieties, Brandon's work touches on those themes a lot. And he does it in a way that's both a little bit I don't know if irreverent is the right word or playful, but it strikes a balance of really giving gravitas to these concerns, but there is kind of a tongue in cheek levity to them. Eduardo Corral wrote a blurb that I'm gonna read because I think that that articulates well what I'm trying to say. Amico's use of language is ecstatic. The linguistic exuberance and disappearing ink echoes our relentless times. Accurate. I also picked up and half finished reading Graham Irvin's Liver Mush. This book came out this year by Back Patio Press. Um, what's not spoiler alert? What's the word I'm trying to say? Oh, full disclosure. <laughs> I had two cups of coffee today. I should be doing better than this. Full disclosure, Graham is my husband's best friend. So we both picked up copies. So speaking of balancing irreverence with gravitas, this collection uses liver mush, like the, like the actual food liver mush. And I wonder how many of y'all are watching who are like from North Carolina or from the American South who are familiar with that food. It's got pork, liver, pork broth, pork fat. There's actually a recipe and there's like a vegan recipe in the back, which, oh my God, I hope Graham and Caitlin don't kill us. We actually haven't tried to make it, but we will. Like it's on our list of things to do. But Graham uses liver mush as a recurring thematic refrain through which he's exploring mental health and romantic relationships and familial relationships. So it's always balancing on that fulcrum point too. And I think if you check out back patio press. I could be wrong, but I think they also had corresponding t-shirts made. I think it's, it's again, it's very irreverent, right? But I think there's a t-shirt made in conjunction with this book that you can get. And I think it's, I think my husband has it. I think it says liver mush cured my depression. The next book is also from a friend who also got their um, master's degree, their MFA from UNC Wilmington, which is where we met Graham. This book is called The In-Between by Martha Lundeen. And Martha is a former um, housemate of mine. So it's just really cool. I remember being at her kitchen table with them when they were talking about, um, I think they shared with me the title of this book and I was just so excited because it's such a perfect 
title, it encompasses so many of the themes in this nonfiction collection of essays. So I will read the back, I'll read the description for y'all. The essays in the in-between state forward a compassionate analysis of bodies, queer bodies, bodies of water, bodies that are hated and bodies that deserve love. Martha Lynn Dean in 15 moving essays attempts to understand the ways in which people try to shape landscapes, how this can be a violent act even as, as it seeks to be loving in some ways, and that this violence is not so different from the ways in which queer people shape their bodies to fit in or live outside of a norm. So if those are themes that speak to you or that you're interested in reading about, I definitely recommend picking up this essay collection. It's just really rewarding to be able to read this collection having seen it or parts of it in earlier thesis versions. I also picked up um, Frank Sonnets by Diane Seuss. And correct me if I'm wrong, like I think this just won the Pulitzer right? Or like, it's so good, guys. It's so good. Spoiler alert, if I do a favorite books of 2022, I mean, this is it. It gets, it, it does deserve the hype. This book will probably demand a reread, multiple rereads. It is so beautiful. This book really reinforces the idea that I have be begun to like just develop, which probably already exists in the world. Probably smarter people than I, than myself have articulated this, but I really do think that so much of what makes us good writers or good artists is our ability to like attune our attention to something and really focus on the small details. And now I say that knowing that, you know, for some people who are neurodivergent, right? If you have ADHD, sometimes this idea of like attention is gonna be different than somebody who isn't neurodivergent in that way. I do not have ADHD, but I hate how much my smartphone <laughs> that I'm filming on I hate how much it has disrupted my attention. I hate that we're living in an attention economy, even as I'm talking to y'all, creating content myself. I used to be able to sit and read for hours and hours. I, you know, I remember the feeling of how uncomfortable it is to be bored as a kid, but then I would just go, I had this huge bead box and I would just go and play with these beads for forever. That was like one of my favorite things. And I would like, read books and play with this is gonna sound so weird i'd like read the secret garden and then use these really pretty i mean they were just plastic or glass or pony beads or whatever but i would like then make my own i plant like my own little garden i would just i would try to tie back almost anything i would do to books right like i would read the american girl doll series we could never afford those dolls because it was expensive but I would like read these books and they'd spend hours like pretending or drawing my own food for them and cutting them out of paper. I could use colored pencils. Anyway, I'm getting way off base. But what I am saying is, what I'm trying to say is that the attention to the smallest details that are in this book, it's essentially like a memoir in verse. The smallest, most beautiful, most seemingly insignificant things are filled with so much emotional tension and texture. It just really reminds you that life really is just a collage of these small things and that's what we hold on to. And it makes me feel grateful that there are poets at this level who are able to attune their attention to the craft and to their memory to be able to distill language into precisely the formation that we need to convey these moments. It's amazing, it's amazing. Like this book is fantastic. Okay, this is Tracy Brimmel's, um, some of her blurb. In Frank Sonnets, Diane Seuss has written an ambitious, searing, and capacious life story. The poems themselves use an ecstatic syntax to unite Seuss's lyric leaps from one wretched sweetness to another. As a collection, these narratives of poverty, death, parenthood, addiction, AIDS, and the dangerous business of literature are irreducible. It's a book to inhabit, to think alongside, to rage and laugh with, to behold the ways beauty is both a weapon and a relief. That is a fantastic blurb. This is a fantastic book. Here is a novel that I got from, oh, and I think all the books I've mentioned so far um, from the Malaprops books, I just got straight from the presses, the, pre <laughs> the presses, the, in the presses that publish the books. This book I got at a bookstore, I think, think in Charleston. I think I got this on our honeymoon. This is The Anatomy of Dreams by Chloe Benjamin. I have read one other Chloe Benjamin book before, 
that big me immortal list when I tell you I love the immortal list I cried I don't think I've cried at a novel since I was in my 20s and was obsessed with D.H. Lawrence and was still dating fuck boys hands down the immortal lists go get it the reading experience for this wasn't as you know transformational for me as the immortalist but if you enjoyed the immortalist and haven't yet read the anatomy of dreams i think you'll like it this book felt like i was visiting it like every morning when i would pick it up to read it felt like i was inhabiting a space almost which is how i know i really trust an author when it feels like they have crafted a place for me to return to and that i look forward to returning to i i have a fairly poor memory <laughs> and so it's, it's pretty bad you can ask my husband i won't remember the plots of books or movies so it's like give me five years and i can read or watch them again and it's like i'm experiencing it for the first time so I just have vague feelings of how I felt about them. So let me see if I can recap for you what happened without relying on looking up a summary. So essentially, if I'm remembering correctly, there's a young woman who's college age ish and her partner, her romantic partner, and they are interns or assistants to a former professor of theirs who essentially is studying and doing experiments on lucid dreaming. And it creates, there's definitely like a thriller element to this book. I would uh, classify it as literary fiction, but there's a thriller element to it. And it raises a lot of questions about the ethics of agency and consciousness. If you enjoyed The Immortalist, or if you haven't read The Immortalist, one of my favorite things about that book is how she treats, it's not mysticism necessarily or surrealness, but there is this question of how much does mysticism influence science and perception and how much does science and perception influence what is mystical in our world. And those themes were very much also in The Anatomy of Dreams. So I definitely enjoyed this reading experience. Also from that same bookstore, which I can't remember for the life of me, I don't have the bookmark. But this is Clara and the Sun by Kazu Ishigiru. I had kind of like a mixed experience, like a mixed reading experience with this book, which again, right, let's go back to what we talked about with Matt Bell. This is more about me as a reader, my expectations than the work itself. If you enjoy Black Mirror, I think you would really enjoy the plot and some of the themes in this book. Um, the titular Clara is an artificial intelligent friend a companion robot essentially and she gets purchased by um a young girl who i think is 14 and i don't want to give away too much of the plot if i can remember it um like i just said and you know what's weird like my siblings can remember things like one time my brother was like do you remember in this harry potter book when dumbledore said this on page 347 and i was like you're just lucky i would know who dumbledore is did i just say dumbledore <laughs> See what I mean? That was, that's, it's bad. Dumbledorf. Dumbledore. Anyway, my memory is not the greatest, but it really does think about abstract themes of the highest order in terms of like stakes, right? What is consciousness? Maybe not as much, but kind of, right? Because we're dealing with artificial intelligence, but really like what does it mean to love and to have human relationships? And the dynamics between the family members of the humans that she comes to live with is incredibly complicated and those start to unravel throughout the narrative and then that also complicates Claire's relationship to each one of them and then to herself. I think my frustration with reading this book was there were two things that I couldn't quite break myself from thinking about that really framed my reading experience. One was that I kept you, you get this like slow burn of feeling like the shoe is going to drop, like some plot twist is going to happen. And so I kept anticipating that, kept anticipating that, kept anticipating that. And when you finally find out like what the weird thing is, it felt a little too late. And I had already kind of figured it out, but not in a way that was like pleasant. It was in this way of like, it's not a surprise now in a way that I think it could have been darker. For, for, for me, I think it could have been darker if we would have found it out a little bit early on. Again, that goes back to the fact that I do really love Save the Cat. I do find a lot of satisfaction in being so immersed in a narrative that then I'm like, oh crap, we're telling me at the dark night of the soul. That's so cool, I got so enraptured I didn't even see the craft. But subconsciously, I still know to anticipate that. 
So it could just be, again, reading narratives outside of this context of Save the Cat, especially reading more non-American, international authors. Like I think um, Ishiguru was born in Japan, but moved to Great Britain. I just exposing myself to different styles of narrative, even though it's still a fairly conventional narrative structure. Um, but I just, I just felt like that, I just wanted to twist a little bit earlier. And also, you know, I love highly lyrical language. I have a super high bar. I'm a little bit of a snob. I've confessed this to y'all before. I'm a little bit of a snob when it comes to poetic language. I read a lot of poetry. So if you tell me prose is poetic, you gotta deliver. You gotta deliver for me. So Clara is self-described, but then also constantly complimented on being very observational. Um, and she's kind of set aside as being like one of the more highly intelligent artificial friends. But for an artificial intelligence robot to be someone who people constantly say is really perceptive, I wanted better not better, not better, sorry. I just wanted different, more in-depth descriptions of certain things. Like there was one part, there's something about a wall and a wall being yellow versus white. And I was like, wouldn't that, that could have been such a cool moment to like really lean into and really exaggerate to drive home how observant Clara was. And small things like that took me out of the book. But again, that that's probably just says more about me and what I am looking for, what I enjoy as a reader, because also, you know, Ishiguro has won a Nobel Prize in Literature. And I'm sitting here on my floor talking to my iPhone. <laughs> I have not read this book yet, okay? This book I got directly from the author's website. This is Earthworks Ceremonies um, in Tower Time by H. Byron Ballard who is the Asheville Village Witch. I have not read this book yet. Um, I It's one of those books where I just feel like I will know when the right time is. One of my good friends turned me on to um, H. Byron Ballard through a podcast and she was like, girl, you should look into this. And I listened to that podcast, um, loved it. It was a really, really good podcast about people who practice witchcraft in Appalachia, particularly in Asheville. I really fought my husband, not really, I didn't really push it because I knew he wouldn't like it. But we got married on a Friday the 13th and it's because it happened to be the seven year anniversary of our first date and I just wanted to keep that anniversary. It happened to be a Friday this year, which was fine because we did a courthouse wedding anyway. But I was like, could we get the Asheville Village Witch to marry us? And Eli said no. Comment down below if you think Eli was wrong. My poor <laughs> long suffering husband. <laughs> if you haven't watched our two poets taste test literary cocktail videos, I will leave those links up, down, all around. They're a treat. But I have not yet read this book, um, but it is signed, it is signed by H. Byron Ballard. It was published by Smithbridge Press here in Asheville. So I will report back. Also a book that we haven't gotten that we got in Charleston, and this one is Buxton Books. I do remember this. This is The Ghost of Charleston, and Eli and I have not yet read it, even though we said that we were going to like, you know, read one every night. He is, I'm filming this video on a weekend and he's out of town. So Lord knows I'm not gonna read this by myself tonight. We went on a ghost tour of Charleston, which was really fantastic. The man who led our ghost tour was, um, he had been trained classically in Shakespearean theater. So it was just such a treat. It was such a treat. It reminded me of being a kid, speaking of having an attention span pre-iPhone. We would have uh, storytellers come in and they would just tell us stories and we'd all sit around. We'd like crowd into the library and I just love it. I love it. Like as an adult, audiobooks aren't quite the same thing. When, it, when was the last time you were just in a room with a storyteller, right? Like you just got to listen to a story. It's really beautiful. So, so we have The Ghost of Charleston. We have not yet read it. Okay, friends, only two more books left. This is Louise Erdrich's The Sentence. I have not read this. I picked this up at Malaprops. Um, this was actually our uh, vice president treated us to like a, uh, we did the Asheville Ideas Fest and we worked like 14 hour days for like four days straight. So we got some time off and then he was also like, oh, go treat yourself and bring me a receipt, which was very generous. So um, treating myself to Malaprops, 
local bookstores. I have not ever read anything by Louise Erdrich before, but I, I, you know, recognize her name just from being a Pulitzer Prize winner. Look at how cute. It's like an old library card. That's the um, bookmark. Why am I... I was thinking of reading this at the Outer Banks for vacation, but maybe I'll start on this after I finish the book I'm reading now. You guys, I'm so into this, okay? Louise Erdrich creates a wickedly funny ghost story, a tale of passion, of a complex marriage, and of a woman's relentless errors. Her latest novel, The Sentence, asks what we owe to the living, to the dead, to the reader, and to the book. A small independent bookstore in Minneapolis is haunted from November 2019 to November 2020 by the store's most annoying customer. Flora dies on All Souls Day, but she simply won't leave the store. Tookie, who has landed a job selling books after years of incarceration that she survived by reading with murderous attention, must solve the mystery of this haunting while at the same time trying to understand all that occurs in Minneapolis during a year of grief, astonishment, isolation, and furious reckoning. I'm so ready. And the final book. Also, Buxton. Um, this is Karate Bride. Karate Bride by Nicole Sirocco. Full disclosure, not a spoiler alert. Um, Dr. Sirocco was my, one of my high school teachers. And I remember one of my uh, closest friends, Amanda, had this book. She just loved it, was obsessed with it. And I, why did it take me, how, 13 years? 13 years to read? I don't know. But if you like, it, the, the voice in this collection is so spunky. If you like a spunky American South, you know, I'm sitting on my front porch and I'm telling you everybody's business in the town. It's fun. It's fun. Oh, here's a good, there are really good similes in this collection too. Like here's one I really love. This must, I think this is in Seattle. Okay, this is so, this is so good. This one poem is called Observation Point and it's got two of my favorite similes in the collection. The road shoulder a bank of azaleas, shrubs pink and green as some cheerleader sweater. And here's another one. I head downtown, rainier all over us, snow draped like a ghost or at least a boy under a sheet. And that feels like an appropriate place to leave you guys with, right? Like the small joys of reading, why we buy these books, why I buy these books, why I talk about them. Also, plug, um, here is, I guess I technically did get these books um, in the duration of collecting all of these other books. This is my full length collection, Yalubi. It came out in May from Unsolicited Press. I still have a few copies, only a few, that I can sign and send to you. Normally, because shipping is so expensive, if I have to ship them, um, I charge $25. But if you guys, if you want a signed copy of your Luby for $20, leave a comment down below and I'll message you back. And information, actually, I'll just put information. Uh, well, definitely let me know in the comments if you want, but I'll leave information in the description box. But if you are interested in Prague, if you are interested in language translation, if you are interested in family history and mythology and lore, if you want a great grandmother's ghost and some haunted jewelry, this is a collection for you. Thank you for letting me do a shameless plug. Thank you for letting me hang out. Please feel free to like and subscribe. I appreciate you guys for hanging out with me and I hope something poetic happens in your day. Bye.